Hello, and thank you all for joining us. I'm John Vallant, a senior fellow in the Brown Center on Education Policy at Brookings. I have the pleasure of welcoming all of you and introducing what is sure to be an engaging conversation. It's now been 15 years since Hurricane Katrina and the poor response to Hurricane Katrina devastated the Gulf Coast, bringing immense physical, economic, psychological, social, and environmental harm. The aftermath of the storm involved a great deal of effort to rebuild and address many of the problems and inequities that Katrina exposed. One of the most significant and fiercely debated responses to the storm was the effort to reconstruct the public education system in New Orleans as one in which families would choose from a collection of autonomous charter schools. Today, we'll be talking about those school reforms. We'll begin with a short presentation by Douglas Harris, a professor of economics at Tulane University and non-resident senior fellow at Brookings. Doug will discuss his new book, Charter School City, what the end of traditional public schools in New Orleans means for American education. After Doug's introduction, we'll hear from our panelists. Moderating that discussion will be Andre Perry, a fellow at Brookings and the author of his own recent outstanding book, Know Your Price, Valuing Black Lives and Property in America's Black Cities. Andre will be joined by Secretary Arnie Duncan, Secretary of Education from 2009 to 2015 in the Obama administration, and now managing partner at Emerson Collective and Chicago Cred. And rounding out the remarkable group is Randy Weingarten, the president of the American Federation of Teachers and former president of the United Federation of Teachers in New York. We would certainly welcome audience questions for the panelists, and we'll get to some of those toward the end of the hour that we have together. If you'd like to submit questions, please do so via email at events at brookings.edu or via Twitter at brookingsed or hashtag charter school city. Thank you all. And with that, I will turn it over to Doug. Thanks, John. So I want to thank Brookings for hosting this event, uh, especially in this time of crisis. You know, we have COVID, we have our long coming reckoning with racial injustice. Uh, these are, are difficult times. Uh, New Orleans in particular is no stranger to crises. We have a, a long history ourselves with pandemics and with racial injustice and with hurricanes. Uh, we've had hurricanes circling around us uh, lately. And as you said, 15 years ago last week, we had another one with Hurricane Katrina. Uh, I think the big question is how do we respond to these crises? We can roll up our sleeves and make the best of it, uh, treating these as opportunities to correct old problems and think anew or we can let the challenge get the best of us, uh, letting fear and distrust widen prior divides. So depending on your perspective on the New Orleans reforms, you could make either case. Now, one thing not in debate, however, is that the New Orleans school reforms were unprecedented. The state took over almost all publicly funded schools and eventually turned management over to nonprofit charter management organizations. These charter schools were subject to strict accountability through performance-based contracts. The new school leaders were given autonomy, especially over teachers and other personnel. Uh, and in theory, families can now choose the schools their children attend. So when I say the school reforms, this is what I mean, this entire set of policy changes. So it was so unprecedented that no city had ever done any one of these things before. And New Orleans, in the wake of the storm, did all of them at once. And we've stayed on that path now for 15 years. So you can see where the main title of the book comes from. New Orleans became Charter School City. This is a good time to be talking about charter schools because it's been three decades now since uh, the first charter school opened. You know, today, there are more than 7,000 charter schools in the US, and we're in the midst of a presidential election in which school choice, including charters and vouchers, are playing a bigger role than perhaps ever before. So whatever you think of them, the New Orleans reforms are clearly a big deal. Uh, the fact that Arnie Duncan and Randy Weingarten were gracious enough to join this conversation and, and Andre Perry was willing to moderate tells you what's at stake here. So I wrote the book, the book with five goals in mind. So first, I wanted to just tell the story of the reforms, almost like a, a good journalist would do. Uh, it's a really a fascinating story. Uh, I interviewed those who put the reforms in place, as well as reform critics, and reported their stories. Uh, interestingly, though, this uh, reform design was unprecedented. There are actually many parallels between this reform effort and prior ones throughout the nation over the last century. Second, I wanted to put the story in context and the context of the city and its rich history, but also within the broader political and ideological battles in which they sit. Um, in particular, I explain how the reforms fit into the age old debate about markets versus government and schools. Uh, on the one hand, I explain how the nature of schooling is ill suited toward a free market. On the other hand, governments can also fail and schooling can still benefit from market forces, specifically from placing power in the hands of families and school leaders. 
So this leads to one of the main themes of the book, that some combination of markets and governments are necessary to create excellent and equitable schooling. Now, a third goal I wanted to describe the effects of the reforms on those who matter most, students. So when I first came to New Orleans in 2012, I have to say that I was really skeptical of, of the reforms. Uh, in the seven years after Katrina, student test scores and graduation rates had risen very quickly. In fact, almost too quickly. Uh, there were many reasons to be skeptical that these improvements were really caused by the reforms. But I kept an open mind. We could test all these theories uh, that were being thrown out and, and using a vast trove of data that we collected. I started the Education Research Alliance for New Orleans at Tulane and created an advisory board with that group that included both supporters and opponents of the reforms so that we didn't miss anything. Uh, we produced three dozen studies, more than a dozen of which have been published in peer-reviewed journals. Uh, I wanna thank the whole team uh, who worked on this. I really couldn't have done it without you. So what did we find after all these years of analysis? So it actually turned out that, uh, that the reforms did improve student outcomes. Uh, the reforms raised average student test scores in the city from the 22nd percentile nationally to the 37th percentile. Compared with the match comparison group of districts, the high school graduation rate increased three to nine percentage points. College enrollment increased eight to 15 percentage points. College completion increased three to five percentage points. Uh, the results improved for all students, black and white, rich and poor. Uh, opportunity gaps declined, parent satisfaction improved. We could rule out uh, most of the alternative explanations. So this is the second way in which the reforms were unprecedented. No one had ever designed a system like this before and no reform of any kind had ever shown so much success across so many measures across the entire school district. So it's not likely that we'd see the same effects if we adopted the reforms elsewhere, but this is at least a proof of concept. Fourth, I wanted to explain why student outcomes increased the way they were. This is in some sense, the most important question. You know, this was a whole package of reform. So what, what part of it actually mattered the most? Uh, school funding is one factor that comes up a lot, and money certainly does matter in schools. Uh, and New Orleans increased, uh, increased spending by about 13% uh, uh, after, the, after the reforms were put in place uh, compared to the, the other similar districts. Uh, but this is probably still not the main explanation for improvement. The district was already around the state average on funding before Katrina, uh, but it was far below the state average on its effectiveness. So in other words, the district was pretty dysfunctional. And so just putting more money into the old system probably wouldn't have helped. Uh, you needed to have some kind of reform as well. Competition between schools, school autonomy, they also probably played some role. But there's one thing that really stands out here and that's accountability. So in Louisiana, the main oversight body or authorizer of charter schools was the state recovery school district. Uh, the state wrote contracts with charter schools requiring them to produce high test scores and raise high school graduation rates. And the state was strict about this. There are about 80 schools in New Orleans at any given time in the, in the publicly funded category. And the state opened and then took over more than 40 of them since the reform started. So not surprisingly, if you take over schools based on one measure and you replace them with schools that are better on that measure, then that average is gonna go up. That part's not a mystery. But it's an important point. Uh, remember that the reforms are thought of as a market-based reform but this role for accountability suggests that the government was still maintaining a, a quite large role, just a different one from what traditional districts would have. My fifth and final goal for the book was to talk about the problems with the reforms. So I've talked about the measurable effects of the reforms, but there were some effects that were harder to measure. In the book, I talk about possible negative effects on neighborhoods. I talk about how uh, in a city where the arts are part of the fabric and culture, uh, the arts receive little attention in schools after the reforms and they're mostly seen as a tool for raising test scores. Also, I talk about uh, this, this broader focus uh, and how it neglects an, an unjust process of reform. I think the process matters as much as the results uh, because the process affects what decisions get made. So if you make bad decisions, uh, you, you can get some bad results. I can, I can assure you that if the community had been deciding which schools would open after the reforms, the arts would not have been an afterthought the way they turned out to be. The process also matters because engaging people in decisions creates buy-in. Instead, the process in New Orleans was top-down. This is important because of another issue that is getting well-deserved attention right now, and that's racism. I mentioned how important the authorization process was. Well, here's what one black educator said, uh, someone who had applied for a charter school. And this was his, his description of the experience. He said, we really tried, but it became clear that they didn't want us. We represented a failed black bloated bureaucracy. Controlling and operating schools wasn't for us, it was for them, meaning for whites. 
So that this wasn't true just for the authorization process. Uh, all the key leaders who put the reforms in place were white, even though the vast majority of students in the publicly funded schools in the city and a majority of the voters in New Orleans are black. Most of the city's elected representatives voted against the changes in state laws necessary to put the reforms in place. So partly as a result, the polling data from parents and voters while showing improvement on average still yields a racial divide. So with these reforms, the city's leaders made the best of it in some ways, but the situation also got the best of them. All right, so what does this all mean? I think we can just touch the surface uh, of the book uh, and, and the story uh, and the time we have here, but I hope uh, that some of this has surprised or intrigued you uh, as much as, uh, as I was when I was actually writing the book. But I just wanna finish uh, by reading the last two paragraphs of the book, which I think pull together some of these threads. My main goal here has been to describe what happened in New Orleans and why, as accurately and completely as possible. It's a story worth telling, especially if doing so helps to move school reform forward in some small way. By kindling ambition in our educational goals, creativity in our thinking, and the realism that comes from hard evidence. It is useful to see something that is both new and measurably successful as it forces us to question things we have long taken for granted. Before Katrina, New Orleans may have been the last place on earth to expect anything innovative. Some would say the same right now about the country as a whole. Scholars, experts, and advocates have fretted about how tepidly we pursue even the most modest of educational goals. My hope is that other cities and states will build on the New Orleans experience with a desire to copy not its design and process, but its ambition and inventiveness. No system will ever be enough as each system is what people make of it. The decisions we make are not to be taken lightly given, the character, given that the character of our schools in subtle yet powerful ways shapes the character of the children they serve. All right, well, let's have a, a broader discussion here. Uh, Andre Perry, you can join us here and lead the conversation. Well, thanks um, for that wonderful introduction, Doug. As uh, many people know, I was an educational leader in New Orleans, lived there for 14 years. It's a city that means a lot to me. Um, and I, it means a lot to me that uh, I, I was included in this presentation. So thank you. I, you know, I remember meeting Arnie and Randy in the context of New Orleans ed reform. So um, I think this is in many ways a reunion um, for us. And, um, it, and it's a, an important one given that it's been 15 years since um, Hurricane Katrina made landfall in the city. And I, I wanna jump right into this, but for those who want to um, ask questions, you can send those questions to events at brookings.edu, or you can um, utilize Twitter by utilizing the hashtag charter school city. Um, again, the hashtag charter school city and you can email your questions at events at brookings.edu. Randy Weingarten may have to leave approximately 10 minutes prior to the closing of this event. So I just wanna give you an update. But I wanna pick up where you left off, Doug, on, on this issue of structural racism. Um, as you know, and many know that um, in New Orleans, um, uh, black residents were forced out of schools. Um, police literally shot um, innocent people on bridges and in other areas. There's a lot of, of, of practices and policies that preceded school reform um, that really were revealed by um, the Hurricane Katrina. So I just want to ask you first, Doug, how do you account for structural racism in your analyses? Um, because so many people start with a sort of a before Katrina and after Katrina sort of analysis, but they ignore the decades long um, of, of policy violence level against black people and, and, and black schools. Yeah, well, there's no, no question that that history uh, mattered a lot here. You know, it mattered because of the inequality and income and wealth uh, that it created, which, which itself then influenced uh, access to resources, access to schools, quality schools. Uh, before uh, before the reforms were put in place, uh, it, it matters because of the the, you know, the history of of black people in the city you know, being disenfranchised and not being part of of, uh, of conversations, including about the rebuilding of the, of the city. Uh, you know, a lot of those decisions were made from the outside, and I think one of the key themes of the book is that it was kind of an outside in uh, and top down approach that 
uh, you know, some, some I think, you know, started uh, public conversations and, there, and there, were, there were a lot of public events and meetings held. But when you think about what big, the big decisions were that were made, they were mostly being made from, from people outside the city and not just outside the city because of the storm, but outside because you know, it was the state government and federal government and, and foundations and so on that were, uh, that were really pushing things. So I think uh, that, that certainly had an influence over you know, the, the, the fact that it, a system like this could be put in place uh, the way it would and that, that uh, you know, the, the unfortunate history of, of, of foisting ref, of reforms and changes on people rather than engaging them in the process. I'm going to uh, turn this over to Randy now, this question. About 7,500 employees were fired in the aftermath of the storm. More than 4,000 were teachers. Unions have been portrayed as both antagonists of, of, uh, against change and as victims in the New Orleans story. What role do you see unions playing in the choice movements moving forward? And what have you learned about organizing from the New Orleans example? So, first off, I'm glad to be part of this. And um, that's a big question, Andre. Let me see if I can unpack three or four pieces of it. And again, uh, my apologies for being in a car, but we are, today was the day where we are demanding safe schools all throughout the country. And so I was in Philadelphia, but safety being safety, instead of taking trains back, we're taking cars back and forth these days. So, you know, I would actually just pause for a second on what you just said about who got fired and why. And at the end of the day, the fact that basically the middle, the black middle class in New Orleans got fired and there was except for our union, there was no one within the hierarchy, which was basically white, trying to figure out how to keep the black middle class in New Orleans is a travesty and a stain that still goes on to this day. There, the issue about whether or not what you just said, what the baseline was, there had been such fights and inequity up until, um, or pre-Katrina. So it is a pretty unfair baseline to use public schools pre-Katrina versus market-driven charter schools post-Katrina where there was actually no fulsome public system versus the charter system. And I think that just, uh, actually is very structural issues in the book and I really appreciated that. Going forward, what teachers ultimately want and what parents ultimately want is real choice, but they want a level playing field. And if you actually give them a level playing field where you give them real funded schools and you actually say that this is what you could have in a neighborhood public school, Overwhelmingly, parents and educators will choose the kind of neighborhood public schools because they are foundational, more foundational to communities than not. The issue that we have is that we've actually always been in favor of lots of public school choice, um, but, the, but the kind of politics of all of this have put people into different camps in a way that if you actually engage in any way in the other camp, you get vilified. I'll give you an example. Just this last month, the Charter School Association asked me to speak at the National Charter School Association, you know, because in the middle of COVID, there are so many issues that are joint and we actually represent 250 teachers in 250 charter schools. And, you know, teachers in many, many more charter schools would like to have representation. And Jeannie Allen and her ilk um, made such a big fuss that after I got invited, I got disinvited. So the issue really is, how do you actually have and believe in, and I think that knowing full well 
that still to this day, so many of the charters, I think half of the charters in New Orleans are still getting D's and F's. How do you figure out a way that we make sure that every single child gets the school that he or she thrives in? A school that parents want to send their kids to, that educators want to work at, that is well-funded, and that is actually dealing with excellence and equity. If we could actually compete on those terms, public schools would do extraordinarily well through the, through the United States, and we would not have this inane argument about whether public schooling. We saw this in McDowell County, West Virginia, where frankly, the um, top-down reformers had failed, and we were asked to come in and try to help. We said we wouldn't take over the school system, but we would try to put the best practices in that we know. And this is the eighth course county in America. And if I, st if I stood up those reforms over eight years and what we had accomplished, you'd see something that actually looked a lot better than the New Orleans and other places. It was we increased graduate, we doubled graduate, we increased graduation rates by about 20% or 20 points from 70s to the 90s. We um, doubled the number of kids going to college. We turned around achievement in some of the poorest elementary schools. But the real issue becomes, how do we have these kind of best practices of meeting children where they are, giving them the kind of engagement, relationship building that we're trying to do right now, even in a pandemic, actually make the issues about powerful instruction instead of testing the be all and the end, end all. And actually dealing with the issues of the whole child. And if we could actually do that and not have this ter terrible fight about whether public schools or whether charters, but we could actually fully fund public schools, we would, uh, that, that's the kind of choice system that I think would really work but we can't make it a zero sum system. And that's what we've been trying to focus on and fight for, how now, we have well-funded schools. Yeah, exactly. And I'm gonna actually turn this over to Arnie because uh, many of the things that Randy talked about, some of the, the basic goals, I think you were trying to achieve in, in, in many of your reform um, strategies, in particular race to the top, there were a, a, a lot of um, things in that bundle of, of um, federal um, initiatives to reform school districts across the country. Um, just give me your initial reaction. How do you think um, reforms at the national level played out in New Orleans? And, and looking back, um, what reforms would you, would you advance if you were Secretary of Education again? Sure, I'll answer that directly. And a good friend of mine said to always state your conditions. So before I do, I just say I, I've not been spending a lot of a lot of time on these issues these days. I'm really focused on a pandemic, really focused on trying to keep kids and teachers safe these days, trying to fight for our democracy, um, working to reduce gun violence here in Chicago, which is the, the hardest and frankly the most dangerous work I've ever done. So um, I, I'm not spending a lot of time in the nuances of education policies. We, <laughs> it's bigger, bigger fish to fry these days, quite frankly. But I think at the end of the day, you know, what do we want for, for every child? Um, we want them to have access to great teachers. Um, we want them to have access to high standards. Um, we want to have honest assessments of where they are and where they're not. Um, you know, we, we put a huge emphasis on early childhood education. That's not the point of this conversation today, but that for me is the building block upon, upon which all of this rests. Um, it's, it's interesting. I, I'm doing a weekly call since March around food insecurity, how do we keep, while schools are closed, how do we keep feeding kids? And we've seen just unbelievable creativity and thoughtfulness and compassion and from school districts and nonprofits across the country feeding kids. So you know, what are the goals everywhere, anywhere for kids, whether it's 10 years ago or 15 years ago and now, is access to great teachers, is access to high quality instruction. I would add technology to that mix now more than ever before in this virtual world. That was not you know, something we were we were focused on on there. Um, and we want kids to have the chance to, to not just graduate and go, but go to college. And I wanna you know, maybe complicate the narrative a little bit. I think you can make a pretty compelling argument. There was systemic racism in New Orleans, you know, historically as it was everywhere in the country. 
Um, I would make an argument there was systemic racism in the New Orleans public school system pre-Katrina. And, and as the book lays out, there was systemic racism and how things were set up after. And we have to, in education, be willing to take on these, these kinds of tough truths. And, and, and as we try and challenge the country, we have to look internally and, and look in the mirror. And I mean, there's two, two quick, quick anecdotes just from hard lessons I learned when I led Chicago public schools. Um, we had uh, a real school to prison pipeline. And we challenged that and were able to reduce, you know, the number of young people being arrested in our schools. But that for me was a form of, of systemic racism. But we know who was getting arrested was young, young kids of, of color. Um, we doubled, as we saw in, in New Orleans, we were able to double in four years the number of kids taking and passing AP classes. While that very, very proud of that, I always said the truth is our children weren't twice as smart four years later than they were four years prior. They simply were denied those kinds of opportunities to take higher level classes. And we know who's denied those opportunities as kids of color. So we just had, you know, the, the intersection of class and race is also very, very important. So it's a complicated narrative and just to, to try and talk about it openly and honestly and to look in the mirror and be self-reflective of, of where we were and where we're trying to go. But I think that the goals for me, whether it's 10 years ago or 50 years or today, those goals remain absolutely the same. Can I um, just follow up quickly because, um, um, one of the things I say all the time, kids don't live in schools, they live in communities. It's, it sounds like your suggestion that, that reform needs to take, to take on more community development uh, than some of the sort of technical aspects around curriculum, instruction, governance. Um, is that true? And if so, um, what's the future of reform moving forward? Is, should it be more around community development? Well, I'll, I'll just say again, what, what I've seen all my life, what I grew up in my mother's program seeing was, you can call it reform, you can call it whatever. First, first, you have to meet kids' physical and social and emotional needs. So that's why I've spent so much time over the past six months on the feed, feeding part of this, because my mother's you know, always said, if kids, are, kids' stomachs are growling, they can't learn. And so we have to keep kids fed. We have to make sure they're not being bullied. We have to make sure they're free of fear. Um, we have kids living with an amazing amount of trauma today, and that's probably the biggest thing I'm working on today is trying to help young men work through a lifetime of trauma. And now we have a, you know millions of kids around the country who are experiencing new trauma, who were families were living you know sort of okay paycheck paycheck to paycheck, those paychecks disappeared, and now their whole world has been upended. And so those are the things that we have to do. I'm also going to always be uncompromising, saying we need to have the highest of academic standards. Still, I want kids taking AP, algebra, and biology and physics. I want those high school graduation rates going up because if they're not, we're condemning kids to poverty and social failure. I want more kids going on to you know four-year university, two-year community college, whatever it might be. So we have to be looking at all of those things. And for me, it's it's, it's always a, there's no conflict in any of that. I'm as passionate about feeding kids as I am about them taking AP physics. I'm as passionate about telehealth right now as I am about you know, college completion rates. These things aren't in competition in one without the other. Again, for me, the foundation to all of this is physical and social and emotional health. That's never changed. But upon if you have that strong foundation, then it's absolutely challenge to see that the higher academic results, the better academic results for kids um, that we've seen, whether it's in, in New Orleans or McDowell County or wherever it might be. We just, we just need more. We have to give kids a chance to, to be successful. And last thing I'll quickly say, and, and you guys know this, that when I was in high school, I had friends that dropped out of high school and it wasn't, wasn't great, but it truly wasn't the end of the world. And they could go work here in Chicago in the stockyards and steal meals and you know, earn a pretty good living and buy a house and support a family. And we know that those jobs are gone. They're never coming back. And absent a high school diploma today and absent some form of learning beyond high school, we don't give our kids a chance to compete in this very, very, very tough economy. So this for me is not just about education. It's really about giving young people a chance to enter the middle class, to break cycles of poverty, to provide for their family, and to have the, the kind of life that you know all of us in the Zoom call are, are privileged enough to, to have. And, and I don't wanna- Can I, can yeah, I just ahead. jump in there, Andre, because I think what Arnie just said is probably the most important thing we can do going forward. The, the problem with the reform debate over the course of the last, I would say, let's say 20 years, 
is the same as what's now going on in terms of reopening schools. That top down nationally, there was a lot of mishandling. And so what's happening is bottom up, people are trying to figure this out. I was on one of Arnie's phone calls in terms of food insecurity about what everybody's trying to do to figure this out, about you know having to figure out how to actually meet the needs of kids who don't have digital equipment. And so ultimately, we need to actually nest this conversation about schooling in the conversation about equity and about housing and transportation and food insecurity and, and wellness. And that is why I think you've seen a shift in terms of the school communities focusing on children's well-being and schooling as center of community and community schools as really, really important because we can't, we will not be able to fix um, learning and achievement by ourselves. It's not about the model of charter versus public. It is about what are we going to do about equity and excellence, focusing on well-being first. Now, Doug, I want you to follow up on that because um, you essentially um, said, say in your book that on balance, this has been a successful reform, but it had significant trade-offs. Um, can you, um, from a research perspective, if, if you emphasize test score growth, um, do you overshadow these community issues? And if, if so, how do you elevate um, these um, essential, essential issues around housing, transportation, all those things, um, when we develop sort of reforms moving forward? That's a great question. I think, and you know, you think about Arnie's case when Arnie was superintendent in Chicago, he was the superintendent of essentially all of the schools in Chicago and, and, and probably more easily coordinated with, uh, with other organizations and, and in a decentralized system where you don't really have anybody quite in charge. The district, the local district now is the authorizer of all the charter schools, but can't really negotiate on behalf of those schools because they're really, the schools are just operating under, under contract. So, uh, that said, I will say that if you talk to them individually, if you talk to the charter leaders and, and the reform community, you know, they, they talk about these issues all the time. You know, the, the fact that you know, it, no matter what they do in, in schooling, no matter what they do with test scores and so on, the labor market is dismal for, uh, you know, especially uh, uh, young black people in the, in the city. You know, there was another study done uh, some years ago about social mobility in New Orleans. New Orleans has one of the lowest social mobility rates that the probability of getting out of poverty if you if you've been raised in New Orleans uh, in poverty is one of the lowest in the country so it just reflects uh, that we just we don't have a lot of opportunities you know Arnie was talking about having good jobs and I know he's doing a lot on, on, on crime and trying to reduce gang violence you know all that's still very real here and so and and you said yourself how you know this, the students don't live in their schools, they live in their community. So I think people recognize that that's a problem. The, re the reform, pro-reform group recognizes it and they, I think they try to do things. I think it's more of an open question how well they're able to coordinate across all these separate pieces uh, uh, in this new kind of school system to do that. Yeah, so and I, I wanna um, just dig a little deeper in this. The, as, as Randy noted, the firing of the teachers created a, a huge wound that has really has not healed since. Can you explain the economics behind um, teachers, the importance of teachers in a community, um, not just the, in, the educational sort of benefits of, of teaching? Well, teaching is one of the largest professions, especially in a, in a big city where there are not a lot of private sector opportunities. Teaching in public schools is, is one of the best uh, paths to the middle class. Uh, and so it, at one point I did a calculation, like what percentage, when they fired all the teachers in the city, you know, what percentage of the black middle class was hard? It was, I don't remember the number, but it was a really large uh, number. You know, like 4%. Of like what that? Wasn't it four percent or something? I think it was actually even higher than that. Oh, uh, wow. it was, it, you know, so so just in firing the teachers, you were, you you were getting rid of a large percentage of the black middle class, and 
uh, and yes, you hired new teachers to replace them, but again, they're teachers who are coming in uh, from the outside, you know, not, not so much with a history in New Orleans, and, and many of them don't stay very long. We have a very high turnover rate uh, as well, because teachers tend to, to stay and, and go to where they grew up or near where they went to college. And so it's, it's sort of a, the system is, is sort of designed to have higher turnover in a way. And so you don't end up fixing the problem necessarily, even in the long run, because of the, the teachers being brought in aren't staying and recreating that, that long-term middle class. Now, I'm going to, um, I want this to go to um, Arnie and Randy. Um, and this is around parents. Yeah, the choice advocates will say, you know, it's criminal to not allow my child to have a, an additional option that traditional neighborhood schools don't provide. What do you say to those parents who um, feel that they don't have options and they want government to create them? And I'll start with you. I'll go to you, Arnie, and then Randy. You know, I'll again, just make all this stuff very personal. My, my first job was running an Iowa Dream program with a group of sixth graders. And our goal, my sister and I, was to work with them for six years through, uh, you know, sixth grade through 12th grade. I was the guy that was known as driving the white van around picking kids up after school and bringing them in. And um, the, the neighborhood where we worked was a very poor neighborhood on the south side of Chicago. And after our kids' seventh grade year, the Chicago public schools actually closed that school that we we adopted the entire sixth grade class because performance was so was so poor, and that was a very very hard time. I remember going down to the board of education and protesting that closing, and uh, the, the, it didn't you know the school closed, and we had to scramble to move kids between the seventh and eighth grade year, which is not a natural transition point, and that was a really really hard thing to do. Um, what we found through that experience, though, was actually fascinating, that we were able, um, basically across the board, we placed kids primarily in public schools, we placed a couple in, uh, in Catholic schools, whatever it may be, um, but we were able to find really good fits for our kids, uh, uh, for their education. Very importantly, where my sister and I disagreed with what parents thought, we always followed the parents' wisdom. And not surprisingly, they always had the right choice for what their best education was for their kids. We had a set of twins and you know, figuring out every child learns differently. So I do think it's important that we have you know, really good options for kids. I think the most important thing we can do is have a great neighborhood public school for every child in the country. That ultimately is the goal. For me, whether it's a you know, traditional or magnet or IB or charter, it doesn't, I, the name doesn't, you know, I'm pretty agnostic on the name. I just want a great school. I just want schools where kids are graduating, kids have a chance to go to college. And for me, it's all about quality. And I do, the fascinating thing for me is that none of our parents we've worked with, not a single one had college experience. Many hadn't graduated from high school. So while you might say they weren't, you know, hadn't had all the advantages educationally, they were unbelievably in tune with what their own kids needed. <laughs> they had a PhD in knowing what their child's strengths and weaknesses were and what the best fit for them were was. And we provided two or three or four different options. They, every single time, 100% of the time, picked the right school for their kid. And I think that's just so important that every parent wants the best for their child, whatever their education, their own personal level, ed educational experience might be. And I think really trusting parents, listening to them, um, knowing how much they care, you know, it's the, their, their most precious thing in the, in the world is their child. I'm really trusting them and listening to them. I think it's just so critically important. Randy, parents, what do you say to a parent that says I want uh, government to increase the amount of options for them? Look, I think that parents have a right to want to have lots of different choices. The issue in terms of public versus private choices are the issue about discrimination and fairness and what should be, you know, um, what should be uh, um, held accountable when you have public money. But what I hear parents say a lot is that they don't want their, and I hear teachers say this obviously also, they don't want their thumb on the scale, meaning that you take money away from a public school, you don't actually create the equity there, you don't create the the, um, the AP courses that Ar Arnie was talking about before because of austerity, austerity, austerity. And then because of private fundraising or all sorts of other um, tax breaks or things like that, you can actually stand up a really beautiful charter school. 
that's not the that's not the that's not playing that's not a level playing field we need to actually make sure that public schools have the resources that they need so that a parent has the right and has the choice to send her or his kids or children to a neighborhood public school so we need to fix not close neighborhood public schools we need to stand them up in a way that they can be real choices and and meet the needs of parents and i suspect that if we did that that you'd not have this kind of debate that we have going on right now when i went to school in the dinosaur age we had lots and lots and lots of of catholic schools and there was never this level of vitriol between choices parents made whatever choices they made they and 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 that was um, you know, and and publics and Catholics, frankly, you know, 20, 30 years ago, worked side by side and did things together. But the vitriol, the 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 saying that that the the market that this attempt to prove that the market and privatization is better than the public square, I think, is part of what is wrong with the 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 so-called um with with this movement towards choice choice started as a way of opting white kids out of public schools and ultimately choice should be what parents need for their children but they need to make we need to make sure that public schools can be a viable option for and, parents. And, and I want to take this, relate this a little bit to what's going on in the presidential races. Um, uh, President Trump has, has stated on multiple occasions that he is supportive of choice. And I'll throw this at you, Arnie. Um, what's the difference between um, a Trump level of choice? And, and let's, for the sake of argument, let's remove vouchers. Um, from that equation. Let's remove it. Um, w- how d- does your vision of choice differ from a Trump? Well, I don't think he has a vision of choice. I think he's a con man and kids are pawns in his political game. So it's, it's I mean, I'm happy to ask the question, but it's, it's you know, it's night and day. So uh, we're facing a pandemic. Um, he doesn't care how many kids die. Um, he doesn't care how many teachers die. He doesn't care how many parents die. Um, there's no body count high enough for him to actually listen to science and listen to fact. And the fact that our kids and our teachers and our parents are dealing with what we're dealing with now, the fact that our communities across the country have lost so many people due to COVID. I've lost two friends. I have another friend who's had a couple of fingers amputated. He's got all kinds of neurological challenge. This is a wicked, wicked disease. Um, if Again, throw choice out the window. If the current president cared about humanity, if he cared about kids, if he cared about education, he would have invested a couple hundred billion dollars months ago to help our schools have a chance to be safe so that we could physically reopen as we all want to do. Um, If he actually cared about kids and education, um, he wouldn't have lied and said it was a hoax to not follow science. And so there's there's just no intellectual honesty there whatsoever. Um, the, you know, kids are literally just pawns in his political game. And for me, it's just the saddest, you know, scariest thing that I've, I've ever seen in my life. It's, it's absolutely stunning to me. That it wouldn't matter, wouldn't matter how many people die, um, that it just, it doesn't matter. It truly doesn't matter. What, what the president, what the president does is the president is a con man. We know him well from New York. And so they have a good vo- they have a good word. Everybody loves choice. Look, we want choices in our um, federal election in our federal election. But what they really mean by the word is destabilizing. All um, Betsy DeVos has tried to do is defund and destabilize public schools. To take Arnie's to take Arnie's point, they're trying to take a billion dollars from the care money that was supposed to go to low income students and take it to private schools in quote the name of choice when private schools all throughout the country got PPP, which public schools did not get. So it's just basically a hoax 
and a fraud as opposed to actually leveling the playing field, trying to make sure that we could actually safely reopen schools, get the food, um, get the, the funding for food instead of it being expiring at the end of September, get the funding for digital equipment instead of having 20 or 30 percent of kids right now not having access to digital equipment and getting and not having this really stupid, false, agonizing debate over whether remote is okay if we can't make things safe in a place like Florida. So it's really just a destabilizing of public schools so that the only alternative in his view is private. And it's just a fraud. Doug, um, did you want to respond to that, Doug? I just wanted to ask a quick follow, if you don't mind, to Brandy, because I know she may have to jump off. You know, we'll, eventually we'll be past COVID and we'll be, we'll have a new president and we'll be able to think a little bit. One right. hopes. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so is there a version of charter schooling or of this kind of reform that you would support? And what would that yes. look like? What specific changes would you like to, to see that are in, this, in some ways in the same direction? But, but look, uh, we have, um, uh, look, Doug, we have actually done a whole bunch of work on this in terms of our union has always been open to charter schools. I still serve on the board of one of the highest performing public charter schools in the Bronx that has routinely had 100% graduation rates of our children. We represent teachers in 250 um, charter schools. The real issue becomes we have to make sure that, that public schools have the funding that they need and we have to make sure that everyone is on a level playing field and that there's not this um, jerry-rigging jerry -rigging that we see in some charter school laws that enable charter schools to um, be able to manipulate the data, um, to expel kids, to do these kinds of things, and then say, see, we're doing so much better than public schools. But I do think that there is a place for publicly accountable charter schools in, um, in the school systems of the future. I think that there's really a focus. We have to focus on well-being of children, on, on how we engage powerful instruction, how we create real communities um, so that we're meeting the needs of communities, um, particularly our kids, and how we train teachers to be able to basically be, you know, the you know, mom, dad, grandma, coach, and all of the things that we expect teachers to do, both cu culturally and academically. Um, so, so I think there's a role, but, but what I keep saying over and over again is this notion that the market is better than the public is just wrong. And that was the underlying notion that happened in this top-down model in um, New Orleans, which had to start by expunging and eliminating all public schools, including people who have spent their life, a disproportionately black and brown teaching force that had spent their life becoming teachers and had stood up the middle class in New Orleans. Now, and Doug, I wanna stay on this topic of students, um, special, particularly students with special needs. Um, one of the early um, failures, market failures, if you will, um, was that many, oh, and Randy's gonna to have to, to depart. Sorry. I'm, that's okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank uh, you. For participating. And uh, I just want to say thank you to Arnie for all the work that he's doing right now in terms of food insecurities. It's really a blessing. So thank you, Arnie, for doing all that work. Very good. Now, um, Doug, special needs students, um, many fell through the crack. Many were not being served, particularly early on. How did the charter community respond? And is that has that response proven to be effective? Well, I give a few, a few different uh, responses. Like one is if we look at the test scores, and I know that this is not the only thing we, we should be looking for, looking at, that it does look like special education students also improved academically on average. It does seem, however, just there are enough stories out there where clearly there was discrimination against them in a lot of schools, at least in the early years. I think that's less true now and that the, the, the system, there's been more conversation you know, first at the state RSD and, and now at the local district about having more oversight over that and, and making sure that there are better options. It, it's tough though in a decentralized system, I'll say, for, for a couple of reasons. One is 
that you know, it, these schools tend to specialize. Like the logic of the system is this school is going to be different from that school. They're going to have their own little niche and, and do things differently. And, th and those often don't entail special education as, as sort of the, the, the focal point. So then, then nobody in particular, it's a, so in a traditional public school, all the schools are responsible for providing special education services. And that's pretty spread out except for the most extreme uh, disabilities. Uh, but in a system like this, there isn't, there isn't necessarily anybody in charge. So, it, so the district has tried to create some of those resources and, and uh, for the most extreme cases, but I still think they're struggling a bit with uh, the, you know, the, the less severely disabled students who end up in different schools. Uh, you know, part of it is that a lot of the teachers aren't, aren't certified in special education and, and uh, you know, certified this is one thing that's pretty clear in the research about special education is having a certified special education teacher is actually really important. And it's hard to get certified special education teachers uh, in the world, especially ones who will stay long and, and kind of gather the experience they need to be effective that way. I want to turn to Arnie here uh, to an issue that was near to and dear to his heart, at, at least in terms of policy and practice. This around the issue of discipline um, and discipline practices in a choice model or no, uh, in the in the New Orleans example. Um, what have we learned about school discipline and what not to do, what not to do? And what's the role that school play in reducing violence in general uh, across communities? So I, I don't know, you have to ask Doug the specifics of what New Orleans did in terms of uh, discipline. I, I don't know the answer to that. Just very quickly, big picture, it's, um, you know, you go to DC, you think you know some things and you find out quickly how much you don't know. One of the things we did with the civil rights data collection process was gather a whole bunch of information around the country and coming out of that, to discover that the school, the prison pipeline doesn't start in middle school, doesn't start in elementary school, it starts in pre-K, that around the country we were suspending and expelling three and four year olds. And yes, of course, primarily students of color. That was the biggest gut punch ever. I had no clue, no clue. And I just can't for life of me imagine what a three or four year old would have to do to suspend them or expel them. Yes, they have challenges. Yes, they're dealing with trauma. Yes, they're dealing with issues. But to answer your question directly, Andre, um, the role of schools are to not deal with the symptoms of the pain and the trauma and the anger. The goal is to try and get to the underlying causes. And so that's social workers, counselors, teachers, talking to kids and figuring out what's going on. And let me be clear, there's nothing more important than having a safe environment. I'm never gonna compromise that in school. If it, child brings a knife or a gun, obviously that's not something we can, we can allow, um, but we have to deal with why kids are struggling. And I can't tell you how many anecdotes I've had of kids who are presenting is very angry and very upset. And you find out what's happening, you find out that mom got beaten last night at home or that an elder brother got a shot. And then you have a conversation and you start to deal with what's really going on. Um, the role of schools is to help kids understand that trauma, heal from the, that trauma, not to put them on the streets and to do whatever they can to help them be successful as they grow through those tough times and do well academically. Doug, uh, we only have a few minutes here. I want Doug to, to leave us with sort of a, 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 a reflective uh, question around the book and the writing. If you had to write the book over, what story would you include that you did not include or what issue would you tackle? Um, that you did not. And, and in addition, what are you most proud of uh, for your book? Well, I think I'll answer the, the last part first. I think the, the thing I like most about the book is, is its comprehensiveness. And I think hopefully I didn't go overboard. I, I think it, for folks that read it, you'll see it covering a lot of different topics and a lot of different angles, a lot of different perspectives and trying to talk about both the, the good and the bad. Uh, it ends up uh, you getting a, it gets a little complicated uh, at times, but I think school reform is complicated. Uh, that's and I think so. Part of what I was doing was trying to send that message and and explain that reality that that there's not a simple path. So anybody who thinks that there's you know, a magic bullet, a single thing, if we just did that, then then schools would be a, a lot better. I think the book, uh, as well as many other books, uh, kind of dispel that. Um, you know, and similarly with uh, the market versus government, like just getting the government out of schools is not going to solve the problem and just, uh, or, or, or vice versa. 
Um, in terms of things I would have done differently, I think there are things that we're still trying to do that we haven't been able to do yet. Things we're trying to understand, like the school to prison pipeline, like we're still working on that. And so I wish I had better answers uh, on that. Yeah, some of the discussion of the arts that I just sort of barely was able to squeeze into the book because we're just getting some of those uh, those results. And so I think you know, we, because we were focused on the, the data that we had, uh, that you know, was meant to be an evidence-based book and an evidence-based enterprise, we could only work with the measures that were available. And so, you know, that we, we tried to, to, to squeeze in other things by, with interviews and, and so on, but it was uh, harder for us to do. And, and, you know, in some ways, I think there, there, there could have been more of, of that, more ways of getting at some of those hard to measure things that we're still trying to do, but has been slower to do. Well, thank you all. I want to um, send a shout out to John Vallant, um, Brookings Fellow, who um, opened up, um, Secretary Duncan for joining us, Randy Weingarten for joining us, and of course, Doug Harris. Go get Charter School City in it, wherever fine books are sold. Um, and you can always get my book, Know Your Price, Valuing Black Lives and Property in America's Black Cities. But on behalf of the entire Brookings Institution, I want to thank you for joining us and, and please continue on with the, in the conversation on Twitter with the hashtag Charter School City. All right, thank you. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.